the Bible to the cross from the cross. Every Bible story has three components. First, God's love. Second, God's compassion. Third, God's miracle. Opening your Bible opens miracles. The Bible as one story is holy enough in our lives. Day 32, Exodus 39 to 40. The Handmade Ark. The tabernacle was completed and dedicated at the end of its learn of approximately six months. It was the fruit of many drops of sweat containing the obedience and painstaking care of the people of Israel. First point, the tabernacle built by hand was completed in six months, a year since Exodus and six months into starting the tabernacle. All the work for the tabernacle construction was completed. When the Israeli nation experienced their first Passover, God told them that this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. So a year since the first Passover, the Israeli nation was able to observe the second anniversary. The tabernacle which was built by hand and the Jerusalem temple, which was also built by hand with God's design, was later made into Jesus' cross, which was not made by human hands. Second point, God's repetition was in order for emphasis. God repeatedly spoke in order for emphasis. In Genesis chapter 1, and he was pleased, is repeated seven times. It truly emphasizes how pleased he was during creation. In Exodus chapters 39 and 40, as the Lord commanded, is repeated 18 times. It is wonderful to read how everything God commanded to Moses became fulfilled. In the four Gospels, Jesus mentions it is written around 40 times. This written document that Jesus refers to is the Old Testament. Third point. Moses' confirmation, yes, led the Israel nation to shout for joy, putting behind them the instant of the golden calf. The Israelite nation did the best they could in order to construct the tabernacle as commanded by God. Whilst Moses was doing his final check, the whole nation, especially Bezalel and Oholia, would have waited with bated breath. When Moses finally confirmed that all was okay, the whole nation rejoiced. Moses blessed the nation and God was also overcome with joy. Fourth point, the tabernacle which was one of the three things that was needed to make the offerings was completed. God enabled the humans to receive forgiveness in five ways. These five offerings were to be made in the following three ways. The first was in the designated place where God's presence presided. The second was to be assisted by the priest. The third was to take an offering. With the completion of the tabernacle, it meant that one of three conditions became feasible. Now, the Israel nation was able to enter the designated place with the help of the priest. Fifth point, God's glory filled the tabernacle. When God first met with the Israel nation on Mount Sinai to make the covenant of a kingdom of priests, the Israelites were afraid of God. That's why they asked Moses to speak on behalf of them. But after the completion of the tabernacle, the people saw how God's glory was filled in it. They were able to experience God's glory. Moses, moreover, was granted permission to see God's back. We should also hope to live by experiencing God's glory. Day 33, Leviticus 1-5, to Loretta Leviticus. God, who intended to make Israel 
His holy people told them five offerings as a procedure of that meeting. First point, Jesus' blood has power. Believe in that power. Passover enabled the Israelite nation to gain their freedom. The five offerings made by God enabled all to free themselves from sin. It was only through these five offerings that the people could become a holy nation in a kingdom of priests. In Genesis, we see Abraham trying to offer his son Isaac to God as a burnt offering, but God steps in with a lamb he prepared beforehand. This makes Abraham and Isaac rejoice by claiming Jehovah Zireh. Now, the descendants of Abraham were all able to make offerings to God whenever they wanted with the setting up of the five types of offerings. 1,500 years later, Jesus' blood was offered as God's lamb and with that blood, we all live with God's forgiveness. Second point. Passover was with a one-year-old lamb and the communion was with God's young lamb. The design of a tabernacle given by God on Mount Sinai was completed. The curtain that was made to distinguish between the holy place and the most holy place was ripped in half. 1,500 years later, when Jesus shouted, It is finished on the cross. As such, we can learn that this design by God was made with the intention to serve for 1,500 years. The Passover lamb was the only way the Israelite nation could leave Egypt and seek forgiveness. 1,500 years later, Jesus who came to this world as the Lamb of God opened a way for us to seek forgiveness. We can really see how God thoroughly plans for human beings' salvation. Third point, God provided the Israelite nation with manna and the Israelite nation made offerings to God. Manna and offering are not so different in that everyone is allowed to eat and everyone is allowed to offer. The Israelite nation was instructed to collect manna every day and on the sixth day collect enough for the next day in order to keep the Sabbath. Whilst eating manna, the Israelite nation was expected to learn about the five offerings to God. Amongst God's creation, the only being that can make an offering to God were human beings. An offering was the only way humans could seek forgiveness from God. Sin could not be solved by regret or self-awareness. The only way to seek forgiveness was through God. As humans made offerings to God, they could open a way to be forgiven, to share between neighbors, and to have peace. Fourth point. The five offerings were burnt, grain, fellowship, sin, and guilt. The first offering was the burnt offering. This offering symbolized life and it involved sacrificing an animal to God. The second offering was the grain offering. This offering was to thank God for giving humans food from the ground. The third offering was the fellowship offering. This was to say thanks for the blessings in life. The fourth offering was the sin offering. This was to repent of the times humans were unable to keep the laws. But if this was too expensive for the sinner, God allowed the third person to bring doves or pigeons, and if even this was too much, God said he would receive a tenth of an ephah of the finest flour. Anyone who cannot afford a lamb is to bring two doves or two young pigeons to the Lord as a penalty for their sin, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. 
If, however, they cannot afford two doves or two young pigeons, they are to bring as an offering for their sin a tenth of an ephah of the finest flour for a sin offering. The fifth offering was the guilt offering. This was to repent after accidentally causing harm to God or one's neighbor's belongings. Fifth point, God forgives anyone who repents. Following on from Noah's offering and Abraham's offering, a kingdom of priests offered a system whereby anyone could make an offering to God. The reason this was possible was due to the tabernacle and also the priests. Now anyone was able to make an offering to God. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. God's love and forgiveness has no limits. Day 34 Leviticus 6-7 Priest, always on standby. God, who proposed deeper and more precious meetings on the basis of sacrifice of life, taught ordinance of sacrifice which was the external condition of that meeting. First point, the priest always had to be on standby. There is a five-minute standby rule in the army in the case of an emergency. But for the priest, he had to always be on standby for 24 hours. The role of the priest meant that they had to prepare the wood for the offering. They have to make sure that the incense is always burning. In a kingdom of priests, the offering and the priest are crucial, making the role of the priests a full-time job in every sense of the word. Second point, the people will always be forgiven according to the rule. God said that the priest will make atonement for them before the Lord, and the people will be forgiven for any of the things they did that made them guilty. Jesus too did not criticize sinners, but stated that, For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Third point, someone who picks up someone else's belongings must return it to the owner. The law in a kingdom of priests covered what someone was to do when they found someone else's belongings. If they find the lost property and lie about it, or if they swear falsely about any such sin, that people may commit. When they sin in any of these ways, and realize they are guilty, they must return what they have stolen or taken by extortion, or what was entrusted to them, or the lost property they found. It was crucial that in a kingdom of priests, the people loved their neighbor. This was the kind of community that God wanted. Fourth point. Zacchaeus knew about the guilt offering recorded in Leviticus. One of the five offerings in a kingdom of priests was the guilt offering. This offering was made in cases where someone committed a sin by accident. In such cases, the person was to make an offering to God and to additionally offer one-fifth of the amount as a compensation. Zacchaeus, who met Jesus, said, Look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Zacchaeus knew exactly about the contents of the guilt offering. Fifth point. A person cannot eat a whole cow within the span of 24 hours. The fellowship offering was to give thanks, and whatever was offered had to be consumed by the next day at the latest. But it was illegal to eat it on the third day. 
The intention was for the person who made the offering to share it among their neighbors. This way, those who are less fortunate in terms of financial circumstances can have a chance to eat some of this food. This offering promoted equality and sharing among neighbors. Day 35, Leviticus 8 to 10, Priests, beginning the first official task. The priest who was the mediator between God and people was officially appointed. This new leadership highlighted that privilege is followed by heavy responsibility. First point. Finally, the priests were able to start their job. After months of preparation, finally the priests were able to start their new roles. As instructed in Exodus chapter 29, their anointing started according to the Q sheet for seven days. During the seven days, whilst the priestess gets his anointing, it was the job of Aaron and his sons to prepare everything in the tabernacle. And on the eighth day, Aaron was finally able to start his law as the first ever high priest. After making the offering, fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. This showed that God had approved of Aaron as the first high priest. This system of a kingdom of priests lasted for 1,500 years until Jesus came and shouted, It is finished on the cross. Second point, the nation shouted and kneeled down. Then Aaron lifted his hands toward the people and blessed them. And having sacrificed the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the fellowship offering, he stepped down. Moses and Aaron then went into the tent of meeting. When they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. Aaron's first job as the high priest was successfully done, and the fire that consumed the offering at God's mark to acknowledge Aaron was an important instant. In other words, God's fire did not consume the offering every time it was made. The reason for the fire was so that the nation could see that God had anointed Aaron to this law. When the nation saw that the fire came and consumed the fat portions, they saw for themselves that God had appointed Aaron. Third point, it was important for the high priest and the offerer to work together. In a kingdom of priests, even if the person making the offering came with everything prepared, if the priest did not know exactly what he was doing, it meant that the offering could not be made properly. It was important that both the person making the offering and the priest were offering with a wholehearted attitude. In other words, it was important that the two hands clapped together. Fourth point, it was the job of the priest to distinguish between the right and wrong. It was important that the high priest distinguished between what was for God and the neighbors and what was for himself. Indeed, it was important that he distinguished between doing what was wise and otherwise. When Aaron carried out his first job as the high priest, the Lord's fire consumed the offering, but when Aaron's two sons made an offering, the Lord came and killed them both. It seems as though Aaron's two sons had drunken alcohol before making an offering. This incident really put into 
perspective how the role of the priest came with serious responsibility as much as privilege. Fifth point, Eliezer and Itama become role models in a kingdom of priests. After the death of Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's third and fourth sons step up as the new priests. The death of Nadab and Abihu would, of course, have been a total and utter shock for this family. But Moses told them not to cry or to mourn. Aaron's family was instructed to use this as a lesson to understand how serious their roles were. The reason why Moses told Aaron's family to do this was so that they could all acknowledge that what happened was right in the eyes of God, and that it was their responsibility to come to terms with it. Do not let your hair become unkempt, and do not tear your clothes, or you will die, and the Lord will be angry with the whole community. But your relatives, old Israelites, may mourn for those the Lord has destroyed by fire. Privilege comes with responsibility. We can see here just how hard Moses and Aaron worked to establish and maintain a kingdom of priests. Day 36, Leviticus 11 to 13. Leviticus 11 to Daniel 1. God wanted the people of Israel to keep a healthy lifestyle by acting wholly before Him, starting from detailed parts such as eating. First point. Without Leviticus chapter 11, there would be no Daniel chapter 1. Leviticus chapter 11 is like a mother instructing her child not to eat junk food. Looking into its contents, it instructs which animals are clean to eat and which are not. We can see just how important this was later on in the book of Daniel. When Daniel is taken captive to Babylon as a teenager, he decides not to eat the food and wine of the Babylonian Empire. So why did Daniel make such a decision? This was down to his parents educating him about Leviticus chapter 11. Daniel therefore stuck to the laws written in Leviticus chapter 11. This, in the long run, meant that Daniel was ready to be used as God's prophet rather than a slave of the Babylonian Empire. Like this, Daniel lived his entire life by keeping the laws given by God to Moses, so much so that the people who wanted to see his downfall had to look up the Pentateuch in order to trap him. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, this man said we will never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Leviticus was what Daniel stood by for all his life even as a high-ranking official of an empire. Second point, God is the nutritionist for human abundance and growth. No one knows more about the human body than God. God knows everything there is about which food is most healthy and suitable for the human body. God told the Israelites through Moses what exactly the human body needed to eat in order to be fit and healthy. God wants humans to live a healthy and a wholesome life by consuming the best possible food. I'm the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I'm holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. Third point, maternity leave 
as God's holiness. God's greatest interest lies in human life. God gave woman a separate time to have maternity leave so that she can recover her body and also reflect on the miracle of life. According to a kingdom of priests, women must keep their maternity leave, and once it is over, she must offer a burnt offering and a sin offering. But if she cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make a torment for her, and she will be clean. Fourth point. A priest must learn of by heart Leviticus chapters 13 and 14. Leviticus chapter 13 covers what there is to know about skin disease, and chapter 14 covers the details on cleansing from defiling skin diseases. These standards were not made by the priest, but by God himself. Thus, it was crucial for the priest to memorize the 116 verses in order to deal with those with skin diseases. Fifth point, the role of the priest was to mediate between God and humans, as well as between the people and their neighbors. The reason God made the role of a priest was to make sure that the relationship between God and the Israel nation would be maintained as well as the relationship between the people themselves. And so it was important that the priests had knowledge on God's commands. They had to know all about the five offerings as well as the other roles given by God. Knowledge on skin disease was particularly important. In cases of defiling skin diseases, be very careful to do exactly as the Levitical priests instruct you. You must follow carefully what I have commanded them. Day 37 Leviticus 14-15 If one cannot afford, God who had a deep interest in human life told them in detail the procedure of confirming such diseases as leprosy and how to discharge and purify them. First point, Jesus kept the rules regarding skin disease according to a kingdom of priests. Leviticus chapter 14 connects to Matthew chapter 8. Leviticus chapter 14 covers how someone who has recovered from skin disease is to go back living in their community. These are the regulations for any diseased person at the time of their ceremonial cleansing when they are brought to the priest. The priest is to go outside the camp and examine them. If they have been healed of their defiling skin disease, Jesus, during his three-year public life, cures countless people. To most of them, he tells them not to tell anyone. However, after curing a person with skin disease, he tells them to go and show himself to the priest. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I'm willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Until Jesus shouted, It is finished on the cross, the laws of the kingdom of priests remained very much valid. Second point. The message in Leviticus chapter 14 was known by many. The message contained in Leviticus chapter 14 was indeed good news to many people. Someone with skin disease was not to live as an outcast, but they were to go live again as part of their community after being cured. The Bible records many people who were cured from skin disease. God made Moses experience leprosy. 
Miriam also experienced leprosy and was cured after Moses' prayer. Naaman, a great command of Aram, was also cured of leprosy. There was also a man with leprosy whom Jesus cured. Jesus, moreover, cured ten people with leprosy. Third point, God's blessing to those who were weak in society. God ensured that the weak within society had a way to live. God even recorded in detail how poor people were to make an offering. They were to make an offering with what they had in possession. Even those who were cured from skin disease were able to joyfully make an offering to God. If, however, they are poor and cannot afford this, they must take one male lamb as a guilt offering to be waived to make atonement for them, together with a tenth of an ephah of the finest flour mixed with olive oil for a grain offering, a log of oil, and two doves or two young pigeons such as they can afford, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. On the eighth day, they must bring them for their cleansing to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. Fourth point, why was the process so complicated? Was it for God or was it for humans? Leviticus chapter 14 records the regulations that were to be kept for someone who had a skin disease. The priest had to make the observation and keep to the nine different stages. If the priest permitted for the person to live at home after being inspected, then this was the law. These rules were not for God, but for human beings. Fifth point, the whole Bible, including Leviticus, is always good news. In the New Testament, Jesus refers a lot to Leviticus. Hence, it is important that we understand Leviticus in order to understand Jesus' teachings. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Leviticus 24.20 is similar to Matthew 5.38-39. Leviticus 19.18 is similar to Matthew 5.43-44. Leviticus 19.16 is similar to Matthew 7.2. Leviticus 19.3 is similar to Mark 7.10. Leviticus 23 5 is similar to Luke 2.41. As such, Jesus' teaching is full of records in Leviticus. Day 38. Leviticus 16-17. God's deep consideration. The priests who were to decide the power of life of the community of Israel were to first offer sin offering to God for themselves before they came into the sanctuary. First point, if Aaron enters the most holy place at any time, he will surely die. A priest must stand in front of God. Aaron and his two remaining sons had to always remember the deaths of Nadab and Abihu. High priest Aaron also always had to remember the incident of the golden calf and how 3,000 people died because of it. Before entering the holy place, it was important that Aaron himself confessed of his own sins. Also very important was that he entered the most holy place at the designated time. This was the only way he was able to avoid his own death and to save the rest of the Israel nation. Tell your brother Aaron that he is not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain in front of the ottoman cover and the ark, or else he will die. 
before I will appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. This is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. He must first bring a young bull for a sin offering and a lamb for a burnt offering. Second point, the day of atonement. God gave the Israel nation three national festivals which were Passover, Festival of Harvest, and the Feast of Tabernacle. Passover was the day the Israel nation was to reflect on how God led them out from Egypt. During the Festival of Harvest, the Israel nation was to celebrate with the first fruits of the crops they sowed in their fields. During the Festival of Tabernacle, the nation was to celebrate at the end of the year when they gathered the crops from their fields. But the most important festival of them all was the Day of Atonement. On this day, the Israel nation had to celebrate the day they were set free and how God blessed them. Third point, once a year, do some major self-reflection. On the 10th of July, the entire Israel nation was to take a rest and not do any work. The day of atonement was the Sabbath of Sabbath. During this day, the people had to thoroughly examine their own faults and sins so that they could live the upcoming 364 days in holiness. For this, the high priest had to enter the most holy place once each year. Jesus served as the final high priest. Fourth point, God's command, do not take the regulations of offering lightly. The sacrificial offerings that were to be made to God had to be killed or dealt with within the grounds of the holy place. The blood had to be sprinkled on the altar and the fat had to be burned there. And all this had to be assisted by the priest. This was the law of a kingdom of priests. An offering was not something that anyone could just do. An offering had to be done in the way God commanded and in God's way. God thoroughly detailed everything in Leviticus. Fifth point, not by gold or by silver, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. God commanded the people not to eat the blood of an animal. God spoke about blood and life to Noah in Genesis. God also spoke about blood during Passover. Another time was during the bilateral covenant. Later on, Jesus' blood connects all of this together. Day 39, Leviticus 18 to 20. The law of leaving the edges of one's field. God warned Israel not to imitate Gentile customs and commanded them to reveal holiness by practicing love upon neighbors. First point. In the desert, where not a single grain grows, God gave the people the laws about how to maintain the land of Canaan. After the instant of the golden calf, God gives in advance to the Israel nation the laws concerning the grounds when they were to enter the land of Canaan. This contained God's promise that he would give them the land flowing with milk and honey. To the people who were living in the desert, these laws must have sounded extremely far away and yet exciting. Second point, Boaz, the man who kept the laws and not leaping the edges of your field, appears in the genealogy of Jesus. Boaz lived by obeying the laws written in Leviticus, including the laws, and not leaping the edges of your field. To Luz, who came as a foreigner, Boaz offered her four kinds of kindness. The first was telling her not to go to a different field. The second was telling his people not to reap the edges of his field. 
Assad was giving Ruth an abundant amount of food. The force was telling his people to pull out some stocks for Ruth to take home. During a time when people did not keep the laws of God, was managed to do so. Consequently, his name appears in Jesus' genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. Third point, the laws of a kingdom of priests concerning foreigners was beautiful even to Ruth the foreigner and the king of Persia, Artaxerxes. Ruth said to Boaz, who truly showed her kindness, May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my lord? Boaz was a gentleman who made sure that Naomi, who had shamefully returned from Moab and her foreign daughter-in-law, Ruth, could benefit from the laws of a kingdom of priests. This act of kindness later stretched to him fending for the two women for life. The law showing kindness to foreigners was beautiful even in the eyes of the Persian king Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes said to Ezra that God's laws were wonderful. Fourth point, passive defense cannot win a storm. God forewarned the Israelites of the storm they would have to face after entering Canaan. The people living in Canaan at the time were idol worshipping people who did not hesitate to offer their children to idols. Despite God's thorough warning that they received in the desert, the Israel nation committed all the crimes as did the people of South Judah, and thus they were unable to escape from the wrath of God. Fifth point. Holiness is practicing thorough and detailed service to your neighbor. God's holiness is about loving your neighbor and establishing a fair society. Leviticus, therefore, can be seen as the holy textbook. Maintaining a fair society means that problems are solved through trial. God told the people not to take sides or be unfair during trial. It was so very important for the people to love their neighbor and to treat each other with respect. Day 40, Leviticus 21-22 Priests, passed down and professor. The priest who were to take care of the community as a holy senior citizens were responsible for keeping the laws that set them apart with responsibility. First point, the reason God called the priest holy was because the priest had to be the one who made the offering to God. God expressed a great deal of appreciation towards the priest who had to mediate between God and humans. Indeed, there are perks to being a priest. However, it is important to remember that a priest had a heavier responsibility compared to the privileges he was given. The priest had to eat clean foods. The foods that he offered to God also had to be clean. It was crucial that the priest knew the laws of God inside out. Second point, ensure that the weak are given their share. God ensured that if someone was the descendant of Aaron and they were too weak or ill to take on the role of a priest, they would be excused of their duties, but they would still be able to receive of the food. Unlike the rest of the twelve tribes, the tribe of Levi neither received land nor were they allowed to take on a different job other than priesthood. However, in the case of the person being ill, God made it a law that they would be excused of the duties of a priest, but they would still be able to receive food. God as such always 
looks out for the weaker people in society. Third point, according to the contents of your offering, you could either step closer to God or step away from God. According to the laws in a kingdom of priests, the people were not allowed to go to the altar without an offering. If they were financially unwell, they were still expected to offer something according to their financial status, i.e. grain. What was offered really brought out to suffice the relationship humans wanted with God. As the offering in terms of its contents and the attitude determined the relationship humans wanted with God, it was extremely important that what was offered to God was without defect. Fourth point, the priests were not to eat offering that was given by the people without God's permission. God gave the priests warnings concerning the offerings that were made to God by the people. Unfortunately, however, the priests later on failed to listen to such warnings. An example of those who failed to listen to God's warnings were priest Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phineas. They were eventually punished for their sins. God made sure that what the priest ate was distinguished from the offering, as the offerings represented the relationship between God and the people. Fifth point, the priests were permitted only to eat a portion of the offering as written in the law. In order to maintain a wonderful relationship with his people, God commanded the priests to live in a certain way. The fact that the priests were permitted to eat a portion of the people's offering was indeed a privilege, as these offerings were given by the people after their labor and were also food without defect. God gave the priests such privileges as they also had to live with an incredible amount of responsibility. Their roles were to be passed down from father to son. Day 41, Leviticus 23 to 25, Reflecting on Creation and Exodus. The feasts that God commanded Israel to observe became the basis of the culture that led their community into a community centering around God and the weak that honored the people. First point, remember creation and exodus. After entering the land of Canaan, the Israelites were expected to keep Sabbath, Sabbath career, and the year of Jubilee. They were also expected to keep Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of Tabernacles. Whilst lasting, they had to observe upon God's creation and also Exodus. They were to observe how God had created the universe and lasted on the seventh day. That's why they were to last on the seventh day. On the basis of Sabbath, God furthermore gave the Sabbath career and the year of Jubilee. Another reflection they had to make was Exodus. How God had led them out of Egypt after Passover. Pentecost marked the 50 days since leaving Egypt, and they were expected to give thanks on that day. The Feast of Tabernacle was so that the people could continuously remember how God is the owner of time, space, and people. Second point, the purpose of the festivals was for all people to come together and to make offerings. Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacle were all designed so that the Israelites can make offerings to God. God used the casting of lots whilst distributing the land in Canaan for the people, and the people were to enter their designated land to make offerings accordingly. This way, anybody 
could come forward to make an offering to God. Third point, the priests took the people's offerings and presented it to God in heaven every day. The priest's role was to mediate between God and the people to carry out the five offerings and also to ensure that the incense did not burn out. They were very busy people. As for the lay person, they were expected to bring the best of their produce to God. This way, the priest and the people always came together to offer the best to God. Fourth point, Jubilee was a time for the poor and weak in society to be restored. The Israelites entered the land of Canaan after being allocated to their land. But after some time, the inevitable problems of some becoming wealthier and more prosperous than others occurred. God had this issue in mind and pre-thought of a solution. This was the Sabbath, Sabbath career, and the year of Jubilee. If Sabbath was not kept properly, it was impossible to keep Sabbath career and the year of Jubilee. This is why God emphasized the need for Israel to keep Sabbath strictly. For six days, work is to be done, but the seventh day is a day of Sabbath last, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day is to be put to death. This was the law for sabbatical year. For six years sow your fields, and for six years prune your vineyards and gather their crops. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a year of Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Do not live what grows of itself, or harvest the grapes of your untended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. Whatever the land yields during the Sabbath year will be food for you, for yourself, your male and female servants, and the hired worker and temporary residents who live among you, at your age for your livestock and the wild animals in your land. Whatever the land produces may be eaten. And this was the law for year of Jubilee. Consecrate the fifteenth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, each of you is to return to your family property and to your own clan. The laws in a kingdom of priests meant that after every 50 years, the people could claim the land that they were originally given. This way, the weak and poor in society were able to find a way to live. Fifth point. After 1,000 years since the formation of the laws in Leviticus, Ezra and Nehemiah kept the Feast of Tabernacles. Out of the festivals given by God, the Feast of Tabernacle was the one that focused on Exodus. It said to the Israelites, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, the Lord's Festival of Tabernacles begins and it lasts for seven days. This record in Leviticus was practiced 1,000 years later by Ezra and Nehemiah. The heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra, the teacher, to give attention to the words of the law. Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. Day 42, Leviticus 26 to 27. Two ways, two futures. God of love and justice talked about two futures that were to be different depending on how the people of Israel behaved. First point, 
Using Leviticus chapter 26, Jeremiah prophesied Jesus' new covenant. Leviticus chapter 26 is the concluding chapter of the book. God's laws contained the blessings and punishments that were to fall on the basis of obedience and disobedience. Put simply, if one obeyed the laws in the Old Testament, they were to be blessed, and oppositely, if they failed to do so, they would be punished accordingly. But as we shall see, 900 years since entering the land of Canaan, the people grew further and further away from God's commands. Because of this, God sent the prophet Jeremiah and made him speak of Jesus' new covenant on the basis of Leviticus chapter 26. Second point, God promised to keep the country safe if the people obeyed the laws of a kingdom of priests. God told the Israel nation that while they kept the laws written in Leviticus chapters 1 to 25, he would guarantee for them two things. The first was their national security. The second was their economic prosperity. Third point, if the people failed to keep the laws, they were to be punished in three steps. The first step was a famine. The second was exploitation. And the third was captivity. If they kept the laws, blessings were guaranteed, and if not, they had to deal with the punishments. After entering Canaan, the Israel nation failed to keep the laws, and so they were punished in these three steps. The first was famine. This was apparent in the book of Ruth. The second was exploitation. This can be seen during the era of the judges. The third was captivity. This occurred in the days of Jeremiah. But God's punishments had a plan. The people of South Judah who were taken to Babylon were to return after 70 years. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to read them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. In order to understand the new covenant mentioned by Jeremiah, it is important to firstly understand the content of the grace covenant and the bilateral covenant. Fourth point, God wants humans to offer their special time and their special offering. Offering the best of our time and produce to God is the very least humans can do. God categorized how each age group was to give to God. This combined both the aspects of time and offering. Regarding tithe, God explained in detail in Leviticus chapter 27 and Deuteronomy chapter 12. Giving yourselves to God was a choice, but offering tithe was a must. Fifth point. Through Leviticus, we can learn about God's unlimited and unfailing love towards humans. Although God warned the Israelites the punishments they would receive if they did not keep His laws, we can see just how forgiving God is throughout the Bible. Especially if the people confessed that they did wrong, they would truly be able to discover God's unlimited and unfailing love. Day 43, Numbers 1 to 2. Five defeats 100. They counted the number of people 
who were 20 years old or more and were able to serve in the army. On that foundation, camps of each tribe were arranged. First point. The one year at Mount Sinai was the fourth step of setting up the census of a kingdom of priests. After Exodus, the Israelites stayed on Mount Sinai for a year where they could set up a kingdom of priests. The first step in doing so was by renewing the covenant. God had formerly made a covenant with Abraham 500 years ago, and now it was time to renew this. The second step was to build the tabernacle. By completing the tabernacle, the people were able to learn about God and how to stand in front of His presence. The third step was to appoint the priests. The priests were fundamental to making an offering to God. The completion of the tabernacle together with the appointing of the priests meant that the people were now set to make an offering to God. The fourth step was to take a census. This was in order to strategically set up a kingdom of priests. Second point, Abraham's descendants started with Isaac and grew into more than 600,000 people within 500 years. Abraham's descendant started with Isaac, but if we fast forward to numbers, the number of men over 20 who were suitable to go to war numbered 603,550. This number did not count the men from the tribe of Levi, and this was in order for them to maintain the duties in a kingdom of priests. It was the responsibility of the men from the tribe of Levi to oversee the tabernacle and all that was in it. According to the 603,550, the 12 tribes of Israel was formed. Third point, five of you will chase a hundred. In Leviticus chapter 26, God told the Israelites that if they kept the laws in a kingdom of priests, five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. And so the Israelites were given the promise that five of them would be able to chase a hundred. This promise is mentioned later on by Prophet Jeremiah as well as the other prophets. Unfortunately, the Israelites were unable to keep the law and thus were taken over by empires Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Hellas, and Rome. Fourth point, the tabernacle was to be placed at the center of the tent. What differentiated the Israel nation's army to any other army was that at the center of a tent was placed the tabernacle. The Israel nation had formerly experienced not being able to do or say anything when the Egyptian army came and took away their baby boys to throw into the Nile River. But at last, these people were able to protect their families and also work towards claiming their land in Canaan. Fifth point, the reason for taking census twice was to first count the number of men over the age of 20 and able to fight after Exodus and second to do the same before entering Canaan. The first census was taken on Mount Sinai whilst establishing a kingdom of priests, i.e. building the tabernacle and appointing the priests. This was with the purpose of counting the men who experienced the exodus. The second time was to count the number able to fight in war 
once entering Canaan. Day 44, Numbers 3 to 4, a kingdom of priests and 8,580 workers. The separated tribe of Levi who were to serve God on behalf of the firstborn sons of 12 tribes were separately counted and put in charge of important tasks. First point, the reason for taking census was to establish an army and also in order to educate the Israelites. The reason God commanded Moses to take a census was in order to evaluate the number of men over the age of 20 in the 12 tribes who were able to fight in battle. The final number of men included those who were actual soldiers as well as laymen who had other jobs. These men also had to participate in training, but not in the traditional sense. They had to be educated on a kingdom of priests. All the men had to learn about God's commands, and also God's promise that five would be able to chase a hundred. Second point, the census taken in Numbers was founded upon the basis of a Passover in Egypt. During the first Passover in Egypt, God killed all the firstborns in Egypt, but he did not kill a single firstborn in the certain tribes of Israel. For all the firstborns God saved, God called them his possession. Afterwards, God commanded Moses to take a census during the year at Mount Sinai. God specifically asked to count the men who were over the age of 20 and were able to fight in war. He also commanded to count the number of males in the tribe of Levi who were older than one month. After the count, there were 273 more firstborns than the tribe of Levi, as there were 273 less Levites the firstborns were made to pay five times 273 shekels, 1,365 in total to the tribe of Levi for their extra effort. Third point, 8,580 people were official civil servants of a kingdom of priests. God said three things in regards to taking census for the tribe of Levi. The first was to include those who were more than a month old. The second was to count the men who were between the ages 30 and 50. The third was to separately count the descendants of Goshen, Kohath, and Merari. The male babies of the tribe of Levi were counted in the census a month after their birth. And until they turned 30 years old, they had to receive education and the tasks involved in being a priest. According to God's commands, the census resulted in the number of male Levite babies a month old and older being 22,000. The total number of Levite males between ages 30 and 50 was 8,580. Fourth point, 8,580 people who worked for a kingdom of priests always had to busy themselves. The Levites helped out the priests in the following when carrying out the five offerings, when looking at the symptoms of leprosy and its cure, when setting the value for the offering, when making an offering without defect, when burning the lamp continually, when setting out the bread. The Levites also had an important role of protecting the tabernacle. They were to stop people who entered without permission, even if it meant putting them to death. 
appoint Aaron and his sons to serve as priests. Anyone else who approaches the sanctuary is to be put to death. Like this, the 8,580 Levites between the ages 30 and 50 had a heavy responsibility. This was because they had been called by God to act as mediators between God and his people. Fifth point, the tribe of Levi was not allowed to plant crops or to hunt animals. God anointed the tribe of Levi to only carry out the tasks for a kingdom of priests. In other words, they were not permitted to plant crops or to hunt animals. They had to be dispersed within the last of the twelve tribes of Israel and to set up the tent. It was their duty to help the nation become a holy nation in a kingdom of priests. Day 45, Numbers 5 to 6. Now the right offering oneself to the extent of a priest. After the people of Israel were counted and the camps with tabernacle at the center were prepared, God implemented the work of purifying the community of Israel. First point, God wanted the people to lead a healthy lifestyle and a healthy family. The Bible contains a person, a family, and a nation. With the Bible, a person can grow prosperous as a kind of family and a nation so long as they do not lose courage or faith. In Numbers chapter 5, God taught the people how to lead a healthy lifestyle by leading a healthy household. God thoroughly detailed how one was to behave and act in order to gain respect from their community and to ultimately live as a holy people in a kingdom of priests. Second point, becoming a Nazarite was deciding to offer yourself to God on the same level as the high priest. Even if you are not born into the tribe of Levi, there are other ways a person could decide to dedicate themselves to God. God gave the law of the Nazarite for such cases. But there were conditions that followed in becoming a Nazirite. As for the high priest, they were forbidden to touch a dead body, even if that dead body was of their parents. As for a Nazirite, they too were forbidden to touch a dead body during their time of dedication. If they ended up touching a dead body, all their previous dedication became zero. Third point, in order to become a Nazirite, the person and his parents had to make a vow of dedication. They also needed a calling from God. If someone decided to dedicate oneself as a Nazirite, they could follow three of God's rules. The first was to make a vow of dedication. The second was for their parents to make a vow of dedication. The third was for God to give them a call. An example is Samson and also John the Baptist. God looked upon the Nadilite favorably. Fourth point, an important role for the priest was to bless the people of Israel. An important role of the high priest was to bless the Israel nation. God blessed Abraham to become a channel of blessing to bless all nations. 500 years later, God commanded the priests to bless the Israel nation. Fifth point, Oaz and St. Paul's blessing traces its roots to Numbers. Oaz blessed the people who worked for him as written in Numbers. Later on, St. Paul also blessed the people with peace and joy. It shows that both knew and practiced what was written in the book of Numbers. Day 46, Numbers 7 to 8, without the lavish clause. 
After all, campus were ready. The leaders of the twelve tribes offered the same offerings, and the Levites offered wave offerings. First point. For twelve days, the twelve tribes of Israel opened a festival for offering. After the first round of the census, the Israel nation established their tent with the tabernacle at the core of their grounds. Once this was settled, the twelve tribes of Israel all came together to make an offering to God. Each tribe came and made their offering in order, and they furthermore decided the logistics behind moving the tabernacle. As such, the twelve tribes of Israel were able to experience the joy of giving to God. This was similar to the giving made by the Israelites when the tabernacle was built. The rich are not to give more than a half shekel, and the poor are not to give less. When you make the offering to the Lord to atone for your lives, receive the atonement money from the Israelites and use it for the service of the tent of meeting. It will be a memorial for the Israelites before the Lord, making atonement for your lives. Second point. The twelve tribes of Israel offered their offering with the moving ark that was to be in use for 500 years. Out of the tribe of Levi, the descendants of Gershon had two wagons and four oxen. The descendants of Merari had four wagons and eight oxen. And for the descendants of Kohath, they had to carry the ark on their shoulders, and so did not have any wagons or oxen. The tabernacle now became a moving ark, but when it was being moved, it had to follow three procedures. The descendants of Gershon had to pull the cart with their two wagons and four oxen. The descendants of Merari had to pull the cart with their four wagons and eight oxen. The descendants of Kohath had to use their shoulders. Not only that, the descendants of Kohath had to use the material given by Aaron to cover the contents within the holy place. Later on, we see that when David failed to follow these procedures, it ended with the death of Uzzah. Third point, the Israelites lifted up their hands to bless the Levites. The twelve days of the twelve tribes of Israel offering came to an end. Now it was time for the tribe of Levi to come forward and for the remaining twelve tribes to lift up their hands and bless them. To close the ceremony, High Priest Aaron came forward and emphasized the tasks that were involved in being a priest. For the remaining twelve tribes of Israel, the men between the ages 20 and 60 had to serve for a kingdom of priests. But as for the tribe of Levi, their serving ages were 30 to 50. The reason they started later and retired early before others was because their tasks were so intense. Fourth point, although it was the job of the descendants of Kohath to move the ark using their shoulders, they were not allowed to go inside the most holy place. Within the tribe of Levi, unlike the descendants of Goshen and Merari, the descendants of Kohath were not given any tools but had to use their shoulders to carry the ark. But more importantly, although they were the ones who carried it, they were not allowed to sit inside the ark. God warned that they would die if they saw it. As such, 2,750 Kohathites were counted to carry out the law of transporting the contents inside the tabernacle. Every Israelite had a role in a kingdom of priests 
but the role of the core sites were exclusive. Fifth point, come close to the holy place, but always be careful. God ordered for the Israelites to build the tabernacle and throw the five offerings. Anyone was able to offer to God and to ask for forgiveness. But it was important that everyone was careful near the ark. The reason God appointed the tribe of Levi to be on standby 24-7 near the ark was to ensure that there would be no accidents of people seeing what was inside. Day 47, Numbers chapter 9 to chapter 10, verse 10. The end of the year at Mount Sinai camping. One year after Exodus, celebrating the second Passover, the people of Israel meditated on the grace of God and prepared for departure. First point. The first Passover happened in Rashi, and the second Passover was observed according to regulations. During the first Passover, everything was rushed, as the Hebrews had to quickly leave Egypt. However, this first Passover became the most important historical incident that had taken place in the past 430 years. A year after the first Passover, the second Passover was to be commemorated thoroughly. Second point, my path is in God's hands. When the Israelites arrived on Mount Sinai right after Exodus, they all feared God. But remarkably, after a year, they had come to obey. They learned to walk with God and to believe in him. Third point, the descendants of Aaron blew the silver horn. During the time Israel observed the second Passover in the desert, God made them make two silver horns. Before leaving Mount Sinai, God made the descendants of Aaron blow the two silver horns. When the nation heard the sound of the horn, they packed and moved. Fourth point, a year into establishing a kingdom of priests, leadership was formed. The process of Exodus and the year residing on Mount Sinai were all led by Moses. But a year into this journey, new leaders were raised. Four groups were broadly formed. The first were the group of priests. The second were the 8,580 people who were civil servants. The third were the 12 leaders from the 12 tribes. The fourth were the 70 elders. More specifically, there were the leader of 150 and 10. Fifth point, the year at Mount Sinai comes to a close. During the year at Mount Sinai, the four steps to setting up a kingdom of priests were finalized. The first step was the covenant. The second was building the tabernacle. The third was appointing the priests, and the fourth was census. With this all done, now the nation was ready to make an offering to God. Now it was time to enter the promised land. Day 48, Numbers chapter 10, verse 11 to chapter 12. Insignificant matters. Though they departed for Canaan, the people who were still immature kept grumbling, and the wrath of God came upon them. First point, leaving Egypt began with Pharaoh's permission and leaving Mount Sinai began with the sound of the horn. If it had not been for the Passover in Egypt, then it would not have been possible for the Israel nation to leave. For the people who had to rush out of Egypt, they were given a year to set everything up and prepare themselves for the next step. Now, 
The clouds covered the ark, and the two silver horns made a sound to mark a new beginning for the Israel nation. Second point, regulations were centered on protecting the weak. When the Israel nation left Egypt, they had to live in an extreme rush. Because of this, the weaker people, such as the children, elderly, and physically disabled became the victims of the Amalek army. But a year later, the Israel nation had the time to establish a system whereby the weaker people could be protected. The men who were above the age of 20 now had the responsibility to protect the weak. The reason God ordered to take a census included the reason of protecting the weak. Third point, the Israel nation started to obsess and complain about the small things. For the past year, the Israel nation experienced God's blessing of leaving Egypt, setting up a kingdom of priests, and ultimately gaining their freedom. However, they started to obsess and complain about small matters. Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord, and when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. Complaining from this point forward, became a ritual for them. Fourth point, everyone needs a companion. The complaining of the Israelites became so unbearable that even the humble and meek Moses asked God to end his life so that he would not have to deal with it any longer. Hearing this, God appointed 70 elders and blessed them with wisdom. Later on, we see that Elijah also asked God to end his life. So God told Elijah that there were seven thousands who did not kneel down to Baal. As such, no one can bear heavy loads by themselves. The responsibility of a leader must also be shared with others. Fifth point, being close to someone does not mean you can just say anything. Aaron and Miriam rebuked Moses for marrying a foreign woman. This came from a place of jealousy towards Moses' position. God, upon hearing this, officially proclaimed how he felt about Moses as a leader. The first was that there was no one more humble or meek than Moses. The second was that Moses was his servant. The third was that Moses was fully obedient to God. The fourth was that God himself spoke directly to Moses. The fifth was that Moses was a servant who always met with God. Even if we are close to someone, we should not point out their flaws. This is the kind of respect God wants us to have for each other. Day 49, Numbers 13 to 14. 10 verses 2 that resulted in 40 years. The people who were gripped with fear after hearing the report of faithless spies claimed that they should return to Egypt. First point. God permits the Israel nation to pre-examine the land of Canaan. When the Israel nation arrived at Kadesh Barnea, they were extremely curious to see what the land of Canaan looked like. But amongst them, no one had ever seen it. They decided that it would be a good idea to precede the land before actually going to live in it. To their request, God said yes. So 12 people, including Joshua and Caleb, went to pre-examine the land. 
The aim of the twelve leaders was the following: to see whether the Canaanite army were strong or weak, to see what the farming land looked like, to see what the ground's layout was like, and also to see whether there were trees in the land. To examine this, the twelve leaders set out for forty days. Second point. After looking around Canaan for forty days, those who wanted to go back to Egypt and those who had the faith to enter Canaan were divided. Upon return from looking around Canaan, the twelve leaders gave their presentations. They all agreed that it was indeed a beautiful land flowing in milk and honey. But from then on, there was a major division. Ten out of twelve men reported that it was impossible to enter Canaan out of fear. At this, Joshua and Caleb stood up and disagreed. But the people tried to throw rocks at Joshua and Caleb, so God had no choice but to intervene. Third point: Moses faces the second most desperate situation of his life. During Moses' lifetime, he faced two major desperate situations. The first was during the Golden Calf incident, where three thousand people were killed. The second was when the ten leaders announced that it would be best to return to Egypt. This time round, fifteen thousand people had to die. Once again, Moses prayed for the people. Fourth point, God decides to let go of the Exodus generation and to educate the Manna generation. God heard Moses' prayer and decided not to wipe out the entire nation. He decides to forgive them, but on the condition that they had to stay in the desert for forty more years. Furthermore, excluding God's servant Caleb. The remaining adults were never to enter Canaan. The only ones to enter Canaan were those who were twenty years or younger. In other words, the forty years were reflected by the forty days. The twelve leaders were in Canaan. Thus, after forty years, only the educated Manah generation would be able to enter Canaan. Later, we see a few similar situations. One being the Babylon captivity for seventy years, which was the result of the people not keeping Sabbath for seventy years. Fifth point: God gave manna even on the night. The Israelites complained. Even on the miserable night, the Israelites agreed with the ten leaders who suggested going back to Egypt. God gave them manna from heaven. After studying all of this in detail, no wonder John could not help writing in one John that God is love. God also provides daily bread for us today and every day. Day fifty, Numbers fifteen to seventeen, Moses' monarchy fiasco, a lesson for revolution. God punished those who disobeyed and complained to him, and exalted the authority of Aaron the priest. First point: Even after the death of the ten leaders, two hundred and fifty people still leveled towards Moses. Ten out of twelve leaders were put to death after coming back from Canaan, and with Moses' prayer. The six hundred thousand Israelites was saved from perishing. The whole incident was lapped up with God's deal that they were to spend a further forty years in the desert, whilst being educated on a kingdom of priests. But regarding the extra forty years in the desert, Korah, from the descendants of Levi, and Dathan. Abiram and on from the tribe of Reuben led two hundred and fifty people to rebel against Moses. For this, 
250 people, clearly the death of the 10 leaders was not enough. Second point, the level of the 250 people read Moses into a dangerous situation. Due to the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and on, all the efforts from the past year in setting up a kingdom of priests was almost thrown out of the window. Furthermore, a few people from the descendants of Kohath even expressed a problem with only the descendants of Aaron being appointed as a high priest. They failed to understand that this was God's decision and thought that Moses had given privilege to his own brother. Third point, 40 years education in the desert, you cannot fool anyone. Moses was unable to persuade Korah, and so he called Dathan and Abiram. He wanted to persuade them, but rather than being persuaded, they rebuked Moses even further. Dathan and Abiram did not go when they were called by Moses and went as far as to claim that Moses wanted to be king among them. Hearing this, Moses was left utterly speechless. Obviously, they had no idea that Moses had pride with his life on the line in order to save them. So Moses fumed in anger. Moses prayed to God not to receive their offering. Instead of handling them in his own way, Moses rather asked God to deal with them according to the rules of a kingdom of priests. Even if the entire Israelites rebelled against Moses, the Levites, and particularly Korah, should not have made the rebellion come to this. This indeed would have been one of the most annoying and lonely times in Moses' life. Fourth point, the golden calf instant ended in the death of 3,000 people and the instant of the 250 people riot ended in the death of 15,000 people. A battle of 250 people against one person. In front of the tent came 250 people with their anger against Aaron. When Korah stood up against Moses and Aaron, God's presence entered the tent. God's presence had appeared twice in Kadesh Barnea and then again in this scene. So Moses and Aaron knelt down and prayed to God. Then Moses said to the people, this is how you will know that the Lord has sent me to do all these things and that it was not my idea. As soon as Moses finished talking, the earth opened up and swallowed Korah as well as the associated people and their possessions. The people who saw this trembled in fear. But the most disappointing thing here was that there were still people who tried to kill Moses and Aaron. But the Lord's presence entered the tent, and Moses and Aaron was able to avoid being killed. Consequently, 14,700 people ended up dying this day. The 10 leaders who went to Canaan, the 250 people who rebelled, and 14,700 people all did up to approximately 15,000 people dying due to one instant. Fifth point, the burning of Aaron's staff was God showing the people an image they understood. During Exodus, a great deal of effort was put into making sure that everyone was safe. However, due to the instant of the golden calf, 3,000 people were killed, and later, 15,000 people were killed in Kadesh Barnea. Despite all this, God continued with a kingdom of priests and even made Aaron's staff bud. 
so that the people could respect him as a high priest. This was God's way of communicating on the same level as the Israelites. God wanted the people to stop complaining. A51, Numbers 18-19 The Shadow of a Good Deed God separated and raised priests and the Levites to give them both privilege and mission in keeping with their positions and establishing a covenant. First point. There are five steps in setting up a kingdom of priests. Numbers chapter 18 once again summarizes how God established a kingdom of priests with his people. The priests were given special garments in order to fulfill their tasks. To break down the five steps, the first step was making of the priests' garments. The second was God's fire that consumed the first ever offering made by Aaron. The third was God forbidding Aaron to show sadness after the death of his two sons, Nadab and Abihu. The fourth was the death of the 250 people who rebelled against Moses. The fifth was the competition between the 12 staffs. As such, these five episodes all show just how difficult it was to set up a kingdom of priests. Second point, Moses continuously kneeled down in order to raise the position of the priests. If Moses had just become king, as the 250 people thought he was trying to become, it may have been easier for him to gain control and to command the Israelites. But the reason Moses put his all towards a kingdom of priests was because he knew the depth of God's forgiveness. Moses, as he confessed, did not take a single donkey from the people because he truly was a servant of God. God was able to set up a kingdom of priests through such efforts of Moses. Third point, to the priests, the function of the tribe of Levi was God's gift. Amongst the tribe of Levi, the descendants of Aaron were appointed as the priests, and the descendants of Kohath, Gershon, and Merari were appointed to help out in the tabernacle. If the priests had to do everything by themselves, it would have been very difficult to operate the five offerings. Thus, God appointed the descendants of Koath, Goshen, and Merari to undertake other tasks. That is why the Levites were a gift to the priests from God. A thread needs a needle like the two sides to a coin. Doing God's work has no high or low. One needs to understand that their law, whatever in scope, is important if given by God. Fourth point, even the Levites had to offer tithe. The Levites also had to follow the laws in the kingdom of priests by offering their tithe. God gave the tithe from the 12 tribes of Israel to the priests. This was so that the priests may also earn an income. The tithe of the 12 tribes of Israel were to be used to cover the living expenses of the Levites to look after the tabernacle and also for aid. But the Levites were expected to offer tithe themselves received from the tithe from the 12 tribes of Israel. Fifth point. Being pre-examined could lessen the problem in the long term. More so than being concerned with the unclean foods, God was more concerned about the effect it had on the human body. 
Hence, God told the priests to examine the good before making the offering. God was consistently concerned that it might damage human health. At around the time, some countries practiced preserving the body for a long time, such as Egypt. But for the Israel nation, God ordered the people to be buried within 24 hours of their death. This was in order to stay hygienic and to quickly make sure that no one was infected. The reference to something or someone being unclean in the Bible was in the same context as God's command for humans to be fruitful and multiply in number. Day 52, Numbers 20 to 21. Moses, who could not enter Canaan. Moses, who should have ordered the rock, instead struck it to get water because of the people's grumbling. God forbade his entrance into Canaan because of this. First point, God measured Moses to a very high standard as the leader. The Israel nation who made it a habit to complain once again started grumbling when there was no water. Moses, who was a humble and meek man, could not keep it in this time. To this, God told Moses to command the rock. But Moses instead hit the rock twice with his staff. When Moses hit the rock twice, water came flooding out. But God pointed out to Moses that he failed to live it as holiness. Moreover, God told Moses that he would not be able to enter the land of Canaan because of this. If we think about it, God forgave the Israel nation on countless occasions for their unforgivable sins. But to Moses, even this one little mistake was not permitted. This was because God had extremely high standards for Moses. Moses accepted that he could not enter Canaan, and until the very end, he did his best to prepare the people. Second point, Miriam saved Moses' life as well as being a true companion. Miriam, who was seven years older than Moses, passed away. We remember that at one point, Aaron and Miriam were jealous of Moses and so rebuked him, which made God punish Miriam with leprosy. Moses prayed for her and she was healed. In many ways, Miriam was Moses' lifesaver and also a true comrade. So the point, the first high priest Aaron passed on his position to Eliezer. After the death of Miriam, Aaron died at age 123 on Mount Horeb. When he died, he passed on his law as high priest to his son Eliezer by handling down his priestly garment. We can summarize Aaron's life in five points. The first was that he was eloquent in speech. The second was that he was forgiven for the golden calf incident. The third was that he had to see the death of his two sons, Nadab and Abihu. The fourth was his acceptance of the incense and staff competition. The fifth was his efforts to save the people by learning into the middle of the plague with the burning incense. The first high priest was Aaron, and the final high priest was Jesus. Jesus confirmed God's love and the forgiveness for us by dying on the cross. Fourth point, the book of Obadiah must be read with Numbers chapter 20. On the way from Kadesh Barnea to the land of Canaan, the fastest way to go was to pass through the land of Edom. And so the Israel nation asked the king of Edom for help. We know that the descendants of Edom 
had become a brother nation to Israel. But the king of Edom rejected the request of Moses. So Moses found a way other than to fight. Long before, God had given the descendants of Edom the land of Seir. And so Moses respected this and did not fight with them. But after the passing of time, God decided to perish the descendants of Edom. This was because whilst the South Judah was being punished for their sins, the descendants of Edom sided with Babylon and helped them instead. God did not forgive the descendants of Edom, who did not care for their brother nation. It is important to read the book of Obadiah and Numbers chapter 20 together in context. Fifth point, God sends venomous snakes to bite and bronze snakes to save. When the Israelites had to find a longer route to go to Canaan, they once again started to complain. At this, God sent venomous snakes and made them bite the people. The people realized that they had sinned and started to ask Moses for help. God told Moses how the people would be able to live. Later, Jesus mentioned the story of the bronze snakes. The people who saw the bronze snakes were able to live. And whoever today believes in Jesus the Savior is able to live. Day 53, Numbers 22-25 Tension for the Levant countries Balak, the king of Moab, trembled with fear and attempted to curse Israel, but Israel received a greater blessing all the more. First point, 40 years after Exodus, the surrounding countries started fearing the Israel nation. Due to the incident of hitting the rock, Moses was unable to enter the land of Canaan. Nevertheless, Moses went with the Israel nation to the Jordan River and helped Joshua in fighting the war. When Moses and the Israel nation won this war, the Levant region heard of this and started to fear them. This showed how Moses' prayer 40 years ago at Kadesh Barnea came true. When Moses prayed for the people 40 years ago, Moses mentioned God's reputation. Although the Exodus generation was a great disappointment to God, the Manna generation made up for it by becoming a fearful nation of God. Second point, the coward behavior of the Amalek tribe and Moab tribe was similar. Forty years ago, when the Israel nation were leaving Egypt, they were chased by the Amalek tribe, and because of this, the weaker people who lagged behind were attacked as well as having their possessions stolen. If the Amalek tribe had been more considerate, they would have helped the Israel nation free themselves from slavery. But the Amalek tribe failed to show kindness and instead did everything they could to satisfy their greed. God punished the Amalek tribe in two segments. The first was by letting Joshua win them. The second was letting Saul win them later. But 40 years since Exodus, the king of Moab showed cowardly behavior. As he was afraid of the Israelites, he cursed them. The reason why God wanted the descendants of Abraham to become holy nations in a kingdom of priests was in order to raise their standards and to ensure that they would not practice such cowardly behavior. Third point. Edom and Moab were able to maintain their lands not because of their efforts, but because of God's promise. 
Even when the Israelites were fighting to take the land of Canaan, Edom and Moab were able to keep theirs. But this was not because of their great power or strategy. The reason they were able to keep their land was because God had given them a promise. Edom was given a promise by God in Genesis that the land would be given to Esau's descendants. And Moab was able to keep their territory as it had been given to Lot's descendants. Like this, God's principles given through a kingdom of priests was the reason their territories could be kept. Fourth point, there were reasons why Balak's efforts became useless and Balaam's steps became useless. Balak, the king of Moab, tried everything he could to find a strategy when he found out that the Israel nation was approaching. The king of Moab asked Balaam to curse the Israel nation. During this process, God made a donkey speak. In other words, God made the efforts of Balak and Balaam completely useless. Nothing they did or said could have changed the situation. Their behavior was indeed foolish. They failed to understand that the whole earth belongs to God. Punishment was also applicable to the Israel nation if they failed to remember this. Fifth point, Phineas worked so hard to the point of arousing jealousy. Balaam tried all that he could to knock down the Israel nation. This was indeed him digging up his own grave. When Balak's scheme failed, Balaam found another way to seduce the people into sin. Most unfortunately, the Israel nation fell into this seduction. God, burning in anger, sent a plague and killed 24,000 people. But Phineas was a righteous man, and he succeeded in turning the Lord's anger. To Phineas, God said, Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites, since he was as zealous for my honor among them as I am. I did not put an end to them in my zeal. Phineas truly showed that even amidst such a horror, there were few people who worked even harder for God. The group of priests showed further courage during the Battle of Jericho. Day 54, Numbers 26-27 Census and Casting Lot At the time when they finished the desert life, the second census was implemented and Joshua was appointed as new leader. First point. Since the first census after Exodus, 40 years later, another census was taken to count the expanding manna generation. 40 years ago, God had commanded Moses to take a census when the Israel nation was residing on Mount Sinai for a year. The census here counted the Exodus generation. Forty years later, the people to be counted were the manna generation who ate manna for 40 years in the desert. The people who were counted in the second census were firstly those who were 20 years or younger during the instant at Kadesh Barnea. They were also the young people who grew up eating manna in the desert for 40 years. These young people tried the best they could not to follow in the footsteps of their parents. Among these people were Joshua and Caleb who were mature students. And for those who were counted in the first census, they all died naturally in the desert as God had commanded. But the only people who were counted in both 
The first and second census were Joshua and Caleb. Despite being the oldest, they did not fall behind in the slightest, and they were moreover allowed to go into Canaan unlike Moses. Looking at the statistics of the first and the second census, the first amounted to 603,550, and the second to 601,730. We can see that there was not a drastic change. The purpose of a census was in order to prepare for the distribution of land after entering Canaan. Second point, the purpose of taking census for a kingdom of priests was in order to distribute land according to the number of people by casting lot. The land is to be allotted to them as an inheritance based on the number of named. The method of allocating land according to the inheritance based on the number of names and in the casting lot method was all down to God who created the earth. This ensured that no one would be left out during offerings by having land to cultivate. By distributing land to everyone, anyone was able to make an offering and also to offer tithe. This way, the priests were able to earn a living from the tithe and ultimately serve full-time as priests in a kingdom of priests. Third point, the daughters of Zelophiat succeeded in receiving land through special law. The Israel nation was now left with the task to conquer the land of Canaan. Although land had not yet been conquered, the topic of who gets which land was an incredibly sensitive matter. But in the case where the father had died early and the family was not counted in the census, it made it impossible for them to be given land. It was here that Zelophehad's daughters made a case for themselves to be able to receive land. With this issue, Moses turned to God and so was renewed the laws regarding land. The first was that the land would be passed down to the son, and the firstborn would receive twice the amount. The second was that in the case such as Zelophiadis' daughters, where the family had no son, the daughter received the land. The third was that in the case where there were no sons or daughters to inherit, a close relative would inherit. Fourth point, Joshua who was in charge of the battle against Amalek now was in charge of the Canaan wars. Joshua was a man who followed and obeyed Moses for the past 40 years. Now God called Joshua who led the people into battle against Amalek to lead the people into Canaan. Fifth point, look towards the land of your ancestors and return to your ancestors. God reiterated the reason as to why Moses was unable to enter the land of Canaan. Hearing this, Moses obeyed. Now Moses did not have too long left on this earth and so he prepared to use the rest of his time wisely. Moses spent his last days teaching the Mana generation about God's laws. Day 55, Numbers 28 to 30 Holy Festivals and Offerings As Israel observed designated holy feasts, they came closer to God and live the holy life with God at the center of their community. First point, 40 years later, God now commands the Mana generation. Festivals are joyful 
occasions in life. In Egypt, the Israelization was not allowed to last. However, the rules in a kingdom of priests stated that they had to rest when various festivals occurred throughout the year. These festivals were designed so that the people and God could meet. At this point, the Israel nation had lived with the laws of a kingdom of priests for 40 years. But unfortunately, the Exodus generation failed to believe in God's word or rejoice in their given blessing. So once the Mana generation was stabilized, God once again reminded them of his promise to give them the land of Canaan. Second point, the Exodus generation half-heartedly listened to God, whereas the Mana generation wholeheartedly listened to God. The Exodus generation saw for themselves the Red Sea splitting in half. They were able to see how God in front of them divided the sea in half, so that they would be able to cross through dry land. But unfortunately, this experience did not last with them for a long time. So for the Mana generation who did not see this, they had to hear what had happened. Third point, God's command that no one worked during Sabbath in order for everyone to come together. God commanded the Israelites to labor in order to eat. God also commanded the Israelites to keep Sabbath. These laws applied to everyone, no matter what gender, status, or age. This was so that no one would be left out from being able to last as God had established during creation and for everyone to be a part of the kingdom of priests. Fourth point, God, who gave everything to humans, was pleased from receiving the most insignificant gift from them in return. The reason God told the Israelites to present an offering of new grain during the festival of weeks was because there was an underlying message that God would first provide three things for them before they can celebrate the day of first fruits. God first promised that he would lead them in victory in battle. God also promised that everyone would inherit some land. Third, God promised that he would send them wind and rain. As such, God commanded the people to work hard and in return, he would bless them in three ways. If they offered the first fruits of their labor, God guaranteed that they would be gifted with more abundant fruits. This was all in order for people to know that it was God who gave these blessings in the first place. Fifth point, a willing offering is the best one can offer. God gave steps for anyone to be able to offer themselves as a Nazarite. It was even better if the family of the person was also willing. The person offering had to know the exact procedures. They also had to give an offering without defect. Next, if they could not decide how much to offer, the priest had to decide for them. But there were a few things the person had to bear in mind. The first was a quick payment. The second was offering oneself with a willing and honest mind. The third was that they could not change the content of their offering. Fourth was not to tell a lie. All in all, one had to offer with a willing and honest heart. Day 56, Numbers 31-32 Moses and the land across the Jordan After occupying the land, Moses distributed it to the two and a half tribes. 
For this, they volunteered as the vanguard during the war that was to take place in the western side of Canaan. First point, 12,000 mana generation. They were able to win their first battle. Up to this point, the battle between Amalek, Jordan, Sion, and so on were all led by Moses. But for this last battle, Moses was commanded to place Phineas, the son of high priest Eliezer, in front and for him to select a thousand men, each from the twelve tribes of Israel, and collect twelve thousand men to fight. The reason for the battle with Midian was because of Balaam's scheme of putting the Moab women out to seduce the Israel men. The preparation for this war involved the tools from the tabernacle as well as a silver horn and 12,000 men with swords. This battle became a sample for the 31 battles which were to come in order to conquer West Canaan. Second point, before the Israelites crossed the Jordan River, they practiced distributing the spoils. They were led by Phinehas together with the 12,000 men won a great victory against the Midian clan. The most surprising thing was that the 12,000 men all came back alive. To this man who experienced great victory, God taught them how to distribute their spoils. But importantly, the spoils were not to be distributed only between the men who went out to fight. God's law was for the spoils to be distributed between the soldiers, the Israel people, and also to the Levites. In some ways, distributing was an even more difficult task than fighting. That's why God gave them such regulations in the first place. God taught them how they were to distribute the spoils from now on, as they had a long way to go. Third point, there were two reasons for Moses' anger against the two tribes. After the Israel nation had conquered the Jordan River, the tribe of Reuben and the tribe of Gad came to Moses and the high priest Eliezer to pre-ask them for their share of land. The tribe of Reuben and Gad had a lot of farm animals, and the land in the Jordan was suitable for farming. But when Moses heard their request, he became angry. The reason why the humble and meek Moses became angry was because of two reasons. The first was because of the regulations of a casting lot. The second was because he thought these people would not fight for the rest of the people after settling in their land. Before, Moses was one to always at least listen to the people's request. But the fact that Moses became angry even before they finished saying their request shows just how sensitive this issue of distributing land was. Fourth point, the two tribes come to Moses to explain. The tribe of Reuben and Gad fully understood why Moses became angry at their request. That is why they reached out to Moses further. They explained why they made such a request. Of course, if Moses said no, they were willing to step back. They had been with Moses for the past 40 years and had obeyed him until this point. They explained that their tribes specialized in farming and so needed special land for their industry. But we will arm ourselves for battle and go ahead of the Israelites until we have brought them to their place. Meanwhile, our women and children will live in fortified cities for protection from the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes 
until each of the Israelites had received their inheritance. After hearing this, Moses agreed to their terms. These two tribes, as promised, kept to their words and fought ferociously for the next five years until the last land was conquered. Fifth point, Moses laid the stepping stones of entering Canaan. The incident with the two tribes actually helped in bringing together the last of the tribes. Moses had worked very hard for the past 40 years, and now he worked even harder to make sure that everything was going well. Later on, we see that the tribe of Reuben and the tribe of Gad indeed kept their promise and was blessed by Joshua. Day 57, Numbers 33 to 36. The story of a land in a kingdom of priests. Looking back over the 40 year desert life, the Israelites were given in advance the boundary for the land of Canaan that they were to enter and conquer. First point the land in a kingdom of priests was decided by God's laws. In Numbers chapter 33, we come across names of approximately 40 places. During the past 40 years, the Israelites resided in 40 different places. The Israelites left Lameses and camped at Sukkoth. They left Sukkoth and camped at Edom, on the edge of the desert. They left Edom, turned back to Pai Hairoth, to the east of Baal Zephon, and camped near Mikdol. These places were all meaningful locations, working toward their permanent homes. God made them reflect back on the 40 years and prepare for the responsibility they needed in order to live in Canaan. As the east of the Jordan River had been conquered, now the last had to be conquered by Joshua and the high priest Eliezer. 500 years ago, God had shown the land of Canaan to Abraham. From then on, this land became the land of faith. 500 years later, the Israel nation was ready to enter this land. Second point, the Levites were dispersed around the 48 castle towns in order to educate the people about a kingdom of priests. The Levites were appointed as leader of the Israelites and so instead of living together, they had to be dispersed between the people. So God allocated them places to live between the 48 castle towns. In all, you must give the Levites 48 towns, together with their pasture lands. The towns you give the Levites from the land the Israelites possess are to be given in proportion to the inheritance of each tribe. Take many towns from a tribe that has many, but few from one that has few. God distributed the Levites evenly across the twelve tribes of Israel. As the eldest son is responsible for looking after younger siblings, the Levites became responsible for looking out for the last of the twelve tribes of Israel. Third point, the people in a city of refugee only waited for the news of the death of the high priest. Within the 48 castle towns, God gave six cities of refuge between them. The city of refuge marked sanctuary for the people. It was a place where people did not have to fear for their lives after committing accidental manslaughter. So then, when could the people leave the city of refuge? They were able to leave once they heard that the current high priest had died. 
The city of refuge and the high priest should therefore be understood together. Fourth point, one tribe was not allowed to move from one land to another. God tells the Israelites not to move from one place to another once settling down. Do not move your neighbor's boundary stone set up by your predecessors. In the inheritance you receive in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Concerning this, God gave them three rules. The first was to keep the law of casting lot and also to be able to retrieve your land after Jubilee. The second concerned whether or not the household had a son. To the daughter who inherited the land, she was forbidden to marry with someone from a different tribe. She had to marry someone from her tribe in order to maintain her inheritance. The third was if there was no son or daughter to inherit the land, the land was to be given to the nearest relative. As such, God told the Israelites to stay within their allocated land in order to maintain the system of a kingdom of priests. Fifth point, maintaining your territory or expanding it shows the difference between a kingdom of priests and an empire. The reason David did not expand his territory, although he had enough soldiers, was because he was dedicated to keeping God's territories according to Numbers chapter 34. In this 8th century, God made North Israel fall in the hands of the Assyrian Empire because they failed to keep the laws of a kingdom of priests. The king of Assyria was so keen to expand his territories that invading Jerusalem was just another day for him. Later on, God made South Judah fall in the hands of the Babylonian Empire, and their fall was for the exact same reason as North Israel. As such, in whatever context, all territories belong to God, and He decides how land is to be used. Day 58, Deuteronomy 1-2 Recollection and Reflecting About the Desert Journey Moses started his farewell speech while recollecting the grace of God and the people's disobedience that were present during Exodus and the 40-year desert life. First point, two months prior to his death, Moses starts again. When God decided that the Israelites would live in the desert for a further 40 years after the incident at Kadesh Barnea, Moses wasted no time in educating the people on a kingdom of priests. In other words, the 40-year desert education was 40 years of law school for the Mana generation. The contents were exactly the same when it was given by God on Mount Sinai 40 years ago to the Exodus generation, who are now in Moab to the Mana generation. Forty years ago, Moses had listened to God's words on Mount Sinai by himself. Indeed, it must have been an honor for Moses, but teaching the people about God was just as honorable to Moses. Moses, leading up to his death, once again used his energy to start again in teaching the people. Second point, the start for the Exodus generation was Egypt, and the start for the Mana generation was Kadesh Barnea. With the Passover lamb, the firstborns of Israel were able to live in Egypt. With this began the Exodus generation. The Exodus generation were those born in Egypt and were able to fight in war. 
these people failed to obey God and so died a natural death in the desert during the 40 years after the incident at Kadesh Barnea. But this incident also began the Mana generation with those who were 20 years or younger. The 40 years in the desert gave time for the Exodus generation to change into the Mana generation. Third point, on the outskirts of Moab, Moses gives Joshua and Caleb a symbol of merit for their obedience. Moses praised the obedience of Joshua and Caleb and also was envious that they were able to enter Canaan. Of course, standards for Moses and Aaron as leaders of Exodus and the 40 years were a different level, and so they were not forgiven for even little disobedience. They were forbidden to enter the promised land because of Moses' disobedience, of striking the rock rather than ordering the rock to produce water in Meribah, and thus failing to show God's holiness. Moses and Aaron were unable to enter Canaan, but Joshua and Caleb were permitted to enter. Joshua and Caleb received a merit from Moses for their obedience for the past 40 years. It was indeed a proud moment for them. Even more surprising was how the last of the 600,000 people managed to pass the test of obedience. Fourth point, the Israelites are told to restrain from hitting Edom, Moab, and Ammon to heart. God had made Israel a very strong nation in the past 40 years, but God told them not to use too much of their strength on their surrounding countries. This was to emphasize that they were a kingdom of priests rather than an empire. Their parent generation, the Exodus generation, had been significantly weaker than the Mana generation in three ways. First, they lived as slaves in Egypt, where they could not even fight the Egyptian soldiers when they took away their male babies to throw in the Nile. Second, they were attacked by the Amalekites who stole from those to wake and lagging behind and could not even protect themselves. And third, they considered themselves too insignificant and comparable to grasshoppers against the Canaanites. The Israel nation had grown so powerful that the surrounding countries feared them. God told the Israelites to practice peace with their surrounding countries, especially Edom, Moab, and Ammon. They were only to fight with the Canaan people. Fifth point, from this day forward, you will be feared by all. After 40 years of education, God said the following to the people, This very day, I will begin to put the terror and the fear of you on all the nations under heaven. They will hear reports of you and will tremble and be in anguish because of you. Day 59, Deuteronomy 3-4 600,000 people and the law Moses, who had led the grumbling people for 40 years, now preached God's word, expecting a new people who were trained and changed by the word. First point, the graduation of the Mana school for the 600,000 people lasted for two months. The start of Mana school 40 years ago in Kadesh Barnea was not the most delightful occasion. On the condition that God did not kill the Exodus generation, 
excluding those who were 20 years or younger, the Exodus generation was to die a natural death in the desert. Now, the 40 years of school in the desert had come to an end, and it was time for the 600,000 people to graduate. For their graduation ceremony, Moses gave four special lectures. The first lecture was a reminder of past instances in the desert. The second lecture covered the broad contents of the present laws of God. The third lecture covered what they were to do when they entered Canaan concerning the Ark future. The fourth lecture was Moses' song and blessing to the Israel nation. Second point, Moses listened for 80 days on Mount Sinai and spoke for 60 days in the outskirts of Moab. From Moses' 120 years, his most memorable times would have been the two times he climbed Mount Sinai for 40 days each to meet God and also the two months in the outskirts of Moab. The record of the first 40 days were as follows. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here and I will give you the tablet of stone with the law and the commandments I have written for their instruction. The records of the second 40 days were as follows. Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water. And he wrote on the tablet the word of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Third point, for the future of the Mana generation, Moses used the Usuing education method. Moses reflected back on the past of the Mana generation before they headed toward their future. Moses thoroughly reminded them of the past 40 years that they spent together in the desert. Moses also educated them from the time of Abraham as well as back to God's creation of the universe. To the Mana generation, Moses asked for three things. The first was to love God's laws. The second was to not add anything to the law. The third was to obey all of God's commands. First point, nowhere else can any person find the laws such as the laws of a kingdom of priests. The kingdom of priests set up by God had the following characteristics. The first was that it began with Abraham. The second was that it was a fair system, especially compared to the system of Egypt. The third was that it was built upon God's promise. The fourth was that it was later continued by David. The fifth was that it was completed by Jesus Christ. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Fifth point, the land which God was to show became their good land after 500 years. 500 years ago, the land of Canaan was the promised land which involved Abraham's obedience. Later on for Isaac, this was his homeland. Fast forward 500 years, this land became the good land flowing in milk and honey. 1,500 years later, Jesus Christ came to this world with the good news to bear the cross. Now, we're introducing the Tongue Dog Bible app to the English world. Download it. Every pastor should tell his people about it. It is a work of genius. That's why the Bible at one story is holy enough in our lives. It's a joy to have you, Dr. Byungo Zo. Thank you for coming from Korea. Can you help me welcome Dr. Zo from Korea?
We brought 20 distinguished leaders from Korea. It's not easy to get out of the country and turn around and go back. It's a joy to have him. I met Dr. Zhou through Dr. Leonard Sweet, and, and then a wonderful relationship began. And it's so important that we understand what's taking place today. Um, for 40 years, Dr. Zhou has read and studied the story, the Word of God. He has read the story more than 1,000 times. He's read the Bible through 1,000 times plus. I've never met another brother or sister that loves the Word, the Bible, the story as much as Dr. Zoe. But over, during the pandemic, in partnership, we developed the Tong Doc Bible app that we are announcing today because everybody in Christendom needs to have the Tong Doc Bible app. And Dr. Sweet, would you like to add something to it? Because this is a precious gift. It is a precious gift. And it's, it helps us to read the Bible as one story. Yes. And we, we've, we've so taken it apart and made it into this big puzzle with so many pieces. And what this, what this man has done um, is be able to tell the story in chronological order as it actually took place in history and to read it um, as one, one story. I've, I've done two church plants in my life. If there would ever be a time for a third, and there may be, I'd have one, one requirement for membership. Can you tell the whole story? Stand up in front of your brothers and sisters. Right. Tell the whole story in 10 minutes. Can you tell the whole story in 10 minutes? If you want to reach this culture, you better be able to tell the whole story in 10 minutes or less. And this app is one of those things that enables me, enables me to, the ways in which we can tell the Bible is one story in, in, in the briefest period of time. So it is a work of genius. Uh, his, this is, it's hard. We, we, some of the best things now are not coming from the West. They're coming from the East. And right, right here, right. you're seeing it. Uh, we need to, I acknowledge, I want us to all to acknowledge greatness when we see it and, and when we experience and Dr. it. Dr. So, presence. we know that you not only did you tell the story, but you put all of your notes into the app, which was not a small task <laughs> as well, because you've read it more than a thousand times. And so talk to us a little bit about the Tong Doc Bible app, and we are honored to, to serve you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you. Sweet. Man, sweet. Uh, great to be here. Uh, for the first 40 years, I read the whole Bible more than 1,000 times. This was because I had important questions. How does the story of creation in Genesis 1 connect as one story to Joseph's funeral in Genesis 50? How does the story of Moses riding a papyrus basket connect as one story to the dedication of the tabernacle in Exodus? And so on. From my reading on the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, 1,000 times, I found a way to answer this. Tongdok Bible. The Tongdok Bible app has three components. First, it is in chronological order. Second, it is divided into 365 days. Third, it has five daily story points as a commentary. I believe that the Tongdok Bible app will help every Bible reader to easily understand Jesus' story. In John 6 verse 29, Jesus says, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. We need 
to first know the whole Bible, and then we can believe. The Old Testament is a prerequisite to the New Testament. The four Gospels is the outcome of the entire Old Testament. The cross is the outcome of the four Gospels. The rest of the New Testament is the outcome of the cross. In the end, the 66 books of the Bible is one story. The whole Bible to the cross, from the cross. I believe that every Bible story has three components. The first, God's law. Second, God's compassion. Third, God's miracle. Opening your Bible opens miracles. That's why the Bible as one story is holy enough in our lives. Thank you, James. Thank you. Yeah. Can you, Thank you, can you say amen? <laughs> now, we're introducing the Tong Dog Bible app to the English world. We begun with English. And what sets it off from all the other Bible apps is that this is one Bible as a story with all of the notes from Dr. Zoe from Genesis to Revelation. And we believe that every Christian ought to have it, download it. Every pastor should tell his people about it. Every denominational fellowship leader should encourage every one of their pastors to get the app as well. Dr. Sweet, is there anything else you'd like to add to this before we? Okay. <laughs> this, is, this will be a resource that will help you and your family and help you with your kids to show them how to read the Bible as one story, as I like to put it, from Genesis to the maps. Because that story continues in your life. It's a never ending story. And that story of Jesus continues as you become a third testament, a third way of Jesus showing who he is in the world. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zoe.